let's uh, carry on. We're uh, in, the, in the series. We're concluding it today, The Blessed Lifestyle. And we've been looking at this amazing way to share your faith that is historic because it goes right back to Jesus. And of course, it's based on this acrostic, B-L-E-S-S. And it is begin with prayer. Uh, what Jesus did was he began every day with prayer. And then the, the L was listen with care. And Jesus listened before he spoke. And we did a whole message on that. And then you eat together. We find Jesus, he's eating together with the sinners and he's becoming friends with the sinners. It's very fascinating. And then he served with love. And of course, I told you this last week, Jesus never turned anyone away. Never. Not once did he turn someone away. And if they had a need, he met their need. And so today we're going to talk about sharing your story. But before we get into that, I think I need to lay a little groundwork for why we need to do this and why it's so important. You know, we now live in a post-Christian culture, and that means that people don't have the understanding. They're a long way back from Jesus today. A generation ago, people understood the virgin birth, and they understood something about Mary and Joseph, and they understood about the disciples and who they were, and they understood that Jesus died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. People don't even know that today. And if they do know that, they only know it very vaguely, and they don't know what the significance of it is. And so we're starting way at the back here, and we're playing the long game. And that's why we're saying to you, and, and, and I don't want this to be a, a message or a series of messages. We're trying to create a lifestyle with this that what we do is we begin with prayer. And the very, very least you can do with the people that you know that don't know Christ, you can just begin with prayer. Put them on the list and begin to pray for them. And I'm going to jump to the E for a moment because I, I had people say, I don't know, I don't want to have people, strangers over to my house to, to eat at my house. I don't want to do that. Uh, first of all, let me point out that Jesus actually never had anyone over to his house to eat. Because Jesus didn't have a house and he was single and the last thing he was going to do is be caught dead making meals for a bunch of people. And uh, instead what you see him doing is you see him going to other people's houses to eat. That's true. You go read the gospel. And any opportunity he had, if somebody invited him for a meal, he went and so did his buddies. <laughs> and that was sort of how it went. And here's my point on this. You have opportunities to eat with people pretty much every single week. If you're in a workplace, you have people that don't know Christ that are having a lunch break somewhere and you can meet with them. You have family members that don't know Christ. You have opportunities to get together with them. You go to events. I know you go to events where you eat and you can do it with people or will do it with people you don't know. So this is, there's far more opportunities than you think about this. You just do it as you go through life. You don't make this, add this uh, something else onto your life. And then when you get there, when you're around the table, whatever table you're around, you just start to listen with care. Find out what people are. Because the last thing you want to do is be jumping all over them with the gospel when you don't even know where they're at, right? And then whatever opportunities you have, you, you serve in, in, in love and you, and you find ways of connecting with them. And I've told you this before last week, that whenever you start serving someone, boy, their hearts just open up to you because you have found a way to be kind and generous and compassionate to them without expecting anything in, in return. And so that's where we, where we go with all this whole thing. And then, of course, we share our story that we're going to talk about today. And uh, I really think that we kind of need a bit of a new approach. And I think the approach that worked a generation ago is, is no longer going to work. And I think the blessed the bless lifestyle is really the way to go. And I think we've got some, some ground to make up because I think, I think in some ways we have harmed the presentation of the gospel. And evangelicals don't always have the best reputation. And you know this is true. So I have a little story for you. So this farmer hears a knock at the door one night and he goes to the door and there's these three men standing there. And one is, is a Hindu priest and the other one's a Jewish rabbi. And, and the third one is an evangelical pastor. And these guys were traveling together and their car went in the ditch and they needed a place to stay for the night. He says, the farmer says, I only have, I only have two beds for you. So the third one's gonna have to sleep in the barn. So the, the Hindu priest says, I'd be happy to go to the barn. So he goes to the barn, and then the rest are getting ready. And there's, there, two minutes later, there's a knock on the door. And the farmer goes to the door, and this is a Hindu priest. And he, and he says, what's wrong? He says, well, there's a cow in the barn, and they're sacred, and I can't sleep in the same place as a cow. So then the Jewish rabbi says, no problem, no problem. I'll go, and I'll sleep in the barn. So off he goes. Two minutes later, there's a knock at the door. Guess who's at the door? 
Well, it's the Jewish rabbi. He says, there's a pig in the barn. I can't sleep in the barn with a pig. Pig or, pigs are unclean. So finally, the evangelical pastor says, no problem. I'll go sleep in the barn. So off he goes. Two minutes later, there's a knock on the door. Guess who's at the door? The cow and the pig. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So, so we see Jesus modeling the, the blessed lifestyle, and his disciples go do it, and they hit it. They hit the ground running with this. I mean, the, the results were fantastic. And don't miss Acts chapter 2, what it says they did. They were continuing in prayer, and they were breaking bread uh, from house to house, and the number of people coming to Christ increased daily, daily. And in the first day, who knows how many people were saved in the very, very first day? After, on the day of Pentecost, who knows? You know, it's 3,000 people. And you go into the next, that's in Acts chapter 2. You go into Acts chapter 3. How many people were saved in Acts chapter 3? It's 5,000 people. And Vin knows these answers, so I'm putting it in the man's mouth. And so we see this tremendous, tremendous effectiveness. And how many of you believe that the effectiveness of the church could once again be that great? We, we have to start believing this, right? Uh, let me ask you another question here. I know I'm wasting my time, but it's good waste. Uh, how many of you have seen the, the Jesus Revolution movie? How many of you have seen it? Uh, I know a bunch of you have seen it because here was the poster for it. We ran it here. We screened it in a few months ago. We had 400 people come out and watch this movie. And it was a remarkable movie. It, it took place in the late 60s, 1969, 1970, the story. And what had happened was the, the hippie movement, and many of you who are old enough will remember the hippie movement. I grew up in the 60s, and the hippies were, were, they were basically sick of the establishment, and they were sick of, you know, the man, and they were seeking after it, freedom and love and, and drugs and, and rock and roll, and, and they were became anti-war and anti-establishment, et cetera. And uh, a big moment in this was 1967. Here's a poster from it. I was able to dig it up. It cracked me up when I saw it. It was the human bee, human bee in <laughs> the gathering of tribes. I mean, only hippies would come up with such a stupid name. The human bee in. And uh, 30,000 people showed up at, at a Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And you, you see those speakers there. And uh, Timothy, or, L Timothy Leary was the, sort of the guru of this moment. And you remember what it was. It was tune in, tune on, tune, tune in, tune on, <laughs> turn on, and drop out, right? And so tune into the movement and turn on to the drugs and drop out. And so they dropped out of the army and they dropped out of the workplace and they dropped out of school. And uh, they were just finding themselves in the world of you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, basically. And uh, by, the, by that summer, they had the summer of love in the same place and 100,000 people showed up. And people thought there was no way that God was ever going to be able to reach the hippies. They were so lost. And then along comes this young hippie by the name of Lonnie Frisbee, who had got saved and, and sort of uh, looked like Jesus himself. And he has this unlikely friendship with Chuck Smith, this stuck-up pastor played by Kelsey Grammer in the movie, which is fantastic. Uh, and anyway, this revival happens amongst the hippie people in the West Coast that actually spread throughout the entire United States. And here they are. You see the two men here. There's an old, old picture of this. There's Chuck Smith and there's Lonnie Frisbee back there. And they were baptizing in the Pacific Ocean at Pirate's Cove. They were baptizing 500 people every single week. And uh, within the course of the two, three years that this movement ran, there was prob they figured there was over 100,000 people that were baptized. So you look at the story of Acts. And then you see this thing repeated in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, it, this was fascinating. I, I showed our leaders this a few weeks ago. Look at, look at that poster or the, those Time Magazine covers is what I'm looking for. So look at that. 1966, Time Magazine asked the question, is God dead? Five years later, the Jesus Revolution. Because Jesus is in five years had turned the thing, transformed the whole thing. And see, here's what I believe, people. I believe that the day is coming and is upon us where God's going to do it again. How many believe that God will do it again? Yeah. I believe God's going to do it again. I, I know there's a lot of things that, that discourage us out there, but I keep on seeing these amazing signs. So I want to tell you a little story about an encounter I, I had the, this summer. 
uh, I was at this event, and I ran into this guy I had known 40 years ago. I had not seen him for 40 years. Uh, he was more of a friend of a friend, and so I didn't know him well. And when you run into someone you haven't seen for 40 years, you don't know anything about them, right? You don't know what they did for a living. You don't know if they had kids or they got married, whatever happened. So, so we ended up uh, actually at an event. We were sitting together, eating together. I don't know if I've mentioned that. We were eating together. And uh, I just thought I would take some time and I would listen to this guy. And he first of all asked me what I did for a living. And I told him I was a pastor. And he was shocked to hear that, that you know, he knew me as a kid. And so I told him I was a pastor. And then I asked him what he did. And he was a banker. And then he tells me this story. I, I didn't solicit this. He just tells me this story. So he said that he went into the world of banking and he got this really plum job in, in North Carolina. And his kids were little at the time, and they moved from Winnipeg, and they went to Carol South Carolina, or North Carolina, rather. And so they wanted, they wanted to put their kids into sports, like you know soccer or baseball or whatever the sports were, I don't know. And uh, so he went and he said to his neighbors, like, where's the community club? And they, his neighbors said, well, we don't have community clubs. We have churches. And he says, what do you mean you have churches? He says, well, the churches run all the sports programs here. There's no community club. If you want to be on a baseball team, you go to your church, you can get on the church baseball team, and the churches play one another, and they organize all the sports. So he thought it was the weirdest thing he'd ever heard. So, so uh, the nearest church was an Episcopal church, so he went down, and there was a great big, huge church. And it was, he, he had grown up Anglican, so this was a, a fit for him. So he goes down to the, the church, and he gets his kids into this program, and and he thought, wow, these people are, and I, I thought, boy, he's, gonna, he's got some really bad story to tell me. That's what I was expecting. I was thinking, he's going to tell me this story about how horrible Christians are. That's what, where I thought this was going. But anyway, that's not what he said at all. He said, these people, these Christians were so nice. And they put our kids into the program, and then, and then they invited us to church. And well, we hadn't been to church for, for 20 years, and and so we, just, and we really only go on wedding and funerals and never went on a Sunday. And so we just started going to church with these people because they kept inviting us to stuff. They kept on inviting us to potlucks and inviting us to events. And we started going to this church. And, and then they said to us, you know what you really want to do? You want to come to adult Sunday school. And they said, what the heck is adult Sunday school? They said, we thought Sunday school was for kids. Why would adults go to Sunday school? So he says, the next thing you know, I'm in an adult Sunday school class. He says, I never imagined in a million years that I would be in an adult Sunday school class. But here I was in North Carolina in an adult Sunday school class. And every week they invited a professor from the seminary who gave us seminary le level lectures on theology. It was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. And I thought, what a great story that this, this guy had experienced the best of Christianity. And he was so enthralled. I was expecting him to tell me how horrible we were. But what had happened is he had run into some blessed people is what he'd run into. And this is why it's so important. And I, I know I'm kind of drilling down on this. That every one of us needs to understand that this is our responsibility. This isn't something for the pastor or for some evangelist somewhere. Billy Graham's dead. This is our job, and we can do it so effortlessly, and it's such an important part of what we're called to do. Because when, when Jesus called his disciples, finish this statement for me. He said, follow me, and I will make you... I will make you fishers of men. Following Jesus means fishing. Following means fishing. And, you know, there's two, two things that are a few things that are sort of interesting about fishing. I thought that's a fascinating me metaphor. I mean, I understood there were fishermen, so that's the metaphor he used. But it's an interesting metaphor because here's the thing about fish. They don't actually want to be caught. <laughs> Am I right about that? Fish don't actually like being caught. They don't really want to be caught. They try to avoid being caught. And here's the other thing about them. When you do catch them, they're slimy and they're stinky. And, and <laughs> let me just finish it. You've got to clean them. And I'll tell you what, that's the hard part. The hard part's not catching the fish. The hard part is having to deal with them after you catch them. Like, I love catching fish. I mean, re reeling in a fish is super fun. It's when I get the stupid thing in the boat, now I have to deal with it. Because if I don't deal with it, and if I don't clean it, and if I don't fill it, and then do something with the guts, it's going to stink. Right? And that's the hard part. That's called discipleship, by the way. And there's, and, there's, and there's two things. Here's, here's the term I use. When it comes to fishing, 
There's two things you need. It's not complicated. Fishing is not complicated. I'm talking about fish right now. Not complicated. You only need two things, the bait and the weight. You just have to use the right bait, and you have to wait, and you have to be patient. And see, I fished for over 50 years. You should, you'd think I'd be good at it. I am not. And you know why? I'm not patient enough. I'm no good at the waiting. When I go fishing, I like to go for half an hour. And you know what? If I don't catch something in the first 15 minutes, I'm ready to go home. And I mean, that is an impatient fisherman. I have friends, when they go, they go for eight hours or 10 hours. That's what fishermen do. You know the old expression, give a man to fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you get rid of him for the whole weekend, right? <laughs> but, the, the, but the second piece of this is, is the bait. The bait, you got to use the right bait. And uh, you know, here's what you need. You need live bait. Yeah, and here's where I'm lazy again. Remember, I'm a bit lazy, I'm a fisherman. I can't be bothered with the whole live bait. It's a lot of trouble. You have to go buy it, you have to have a minnow bucket, and you have to keep those stupid things alive. Or you, you know, it's just a lot of trouble. And if I'm only going for 15 minutes, how much bait do I need to buy? So then I, 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 I trick Kathy, I try to trick her into telling us we don't really need live bait. Now, nine times out of 10, I'm telling you, nine times out of 10, if you're fishing for something like walleye, for example, like we do around here, you're gonna need live bait. Nine times out of 10, the live bait's gonna be better. But I'm always putting rubber worms on Kathy's, on Kathy's reel. Here's the other thing about Kathy. Kathy doesn't touch the bait, nor does she touch the fish. <laughs> and she sits in the boat, and I'm, I'm grateful she goes. But you know, she knows the, 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 the fish are slimy and stinky. And so she swings the rod over to me, and I bait it. She swings it back. She drops it down. She catches the fish. She pulls it up. She swings it over to me. I take the fish off, put it in the bucket, rebait. Re she goes back like this and down. And she does not touch that fish until it's on the plate. That's, that's, I don't know if you can on it. And then she gets home after I've like baited and done all her fish and stuff. She says, yeah, I caught more fish than your dad. I said, well, of course, I was busy being your little handiwork man there, you know, dealing with, with your bait and your fish and filleting it and dealing with the guts and stuff. So, so you know, so, so I've got this thing where I like, I like just to use rubber worms. I'm telling you, they're just not as good as the real thing. And, you know, when it comes to the gospel, what is the bait? Anybody know what the bait is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And you know, we can do all these kind of fancy things, but at, at the end of the day, we can have all these programs and all these things. You know, I want you to think about the early church. What did they have? What are the resources they have? What did they actually have? They didn't have any resources. They had no buildings. They had no money. They had no institutions. They had no organization. They had no political clout. They had no online influencers. All they had was Jesus. And they were immensely successful. Why? Because they had the right bait. And Jesus is the bait, and I don't want you to miss that. So here's what we're going to talk about today. I know I got a long, took a long time to get there. Uh, we, we're going to talk about sharing your story. And here's where, where people need, this is why I told you about the bait. It's really just about telling your story about Jesus. And people always think, well, you know what I need? I, I need all the clever arguments to be able to deal with the objections to the faith. And the answer to that is no, you don't. All you need is your story, and all you need is Jesus in your story. Jesus is the hero of the story. That's where I'm, I'm going with this. So, uh, you know, let me ask you a question. Who is the greatest theologian of all time? If you look throughout all history, who is the greatest theologian that ever lived? And different people would say different things. You know, some would say, well, it was Augustine, or some would say Thomas Aquinas, or maybe John Calvin, or John Wesley. I'll tell you who it is. It was Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was the greatest theologian that ever lived because all those ones since him have been studying what he wrote and trying to figure it out. So the guy who wrote it was actually the greatest theologian. And here's what is so fascinating to me. When he, tell, when he shares the gospel, do you know how he does it? You read the, through the book of Acts. When he shares the gospel, but you know what he does? He tells his story. He didn't do it once. You go through it. Every time he had an opportunity to share the gospel, he shared his story. That's all he did. And so we're going to look at this passage in, in Acts chapter 26. And it's fascinating to me because uh, pa Paul, Paul was pretty pretty determined kind of a guy. And so he's preaching the gospel. He gets arrested for preaching about the resurrection. 
And so he ends up being transferred to Caesarea, from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and he's on, the governor is Felix. And Felix says, look, pal, I'll let you off the hook if you give me a bribe, I'll let you go. Paul was unwilling to do it, and for his efforts of, of keeping his integrity, he went to jail for two years. He spent two years in this jail. In fact, so long that Felix was no longer the governor, and a new governor came, and his name was Festus. And Festus becomes the governor and says, why is this guy still sitting in jail? We got to deal with this guy. We got to get this guy a trial, or we got to do something with him. And then what had happened was King Agrippa was coming. Now, the king, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, was a, a, a guy, man by the name of King Agrippa. And he was the grandson of Herod. So if you're trying to do the math on this story, because remember, this is years later after Jesus' day. So it's, it's Herod's grandson. He, and he comes to see Festus in Caesarea. And he hears the story about this guy in prison. And he says to, to Festus, I want to meet this guy. I want, to, I want to hear from this guy. So then he summons Paul, who's been sitting in prison for two years, and he summons him and he says, I want to allow you, I permit you to speak for yourself. So now, what an opportunity. He has an opportunity to dress the king. He has an opportunity to somehow get out of prison. He has an opportunity to do whatever. And you know what he ends up doing? He ends up sharing his story. And so he begins to speak, and he, and he starts off, and he says, you know, this is, you know, first of all, he says some nice things about the king. Always good idea to flatter your host. So he says some good things about the king, and then he starts to tell a story. He says, I, I was a Jew, not only a Jew, but I was a Pharisee. And when this whole thing started happening with Jesus and the, these people teaching this heresy about how this man had risen from the dead, I objected to it, and I fought against it. And he says, I, um, I, and, and basically he says, I persecuted them, and I consented to their death. He actually says this. He's telling them, this is what I was doing. And he was making it clear. And that's where we're going to pick the story up. I gave you the, I didn't want to read you the whole long story. So I'm just going to read you that part. So here's where he picks up from that. And so verse 12 in Acts chapter 26 says this. So while thus occupied, by thus occupied, he means persecuting Christians and killing them. That's how he was occupied, okay? So, thus well occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me with those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goat. So I said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> and, I, and he said, I am Jesus, who are you persecuting? But rise and stand on your feet, for he, I, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both to the things which you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Of all the things he could have said, he tells his story. He tells his testimony about how he came to Christ. And then, you know what it says? Go read it for yourself. A few verses later, he says, a, a King Agrippa, sa Agrippa says, you have almost convinced me to become a Christian. That's what he said. You've almost convinced me. This was a compelling story. And there's something amazing and powerful about our story. And so I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to throw three things on the screen. And here's, here's, here's why we need to tell, share our story. That num, uh, uh, number one, uh, your Jesus is the message. Number two, your example is the medium. Number three, your story is the method. So going back to the bait, this is why I made this po point. Jesus is the message. 
We're not the message. Don't miss what Paul did. He began his story, talked about his journey, gave a little bit of his past experience, and then he launches into the whole core, the whole purpose of it. See, Jesus shouldn't be an addendum to our story. You've all heard those 20 minute long testimonies about how terrible and wretched and sordid this person's life was. And then at the end they say, and then I found Jesus, amen. And Jesus is not much of the hero of that story. But what Paul does is he makes a big deal about the importance of Jesus and how Jesus had the power to transform him and open his eyes and to come to forgive sins and sending him to the Gentiles. And I mean, it's, a, it's an immense story. So the first thing, don't miss it, the first thing is that your Jesus is the message. The second thing is your example is the medium. Now, just as what, this is what Paul says. He says, you are all living epistles known and read by all men. What's an epistle? Anybody know? Letter. It's just a letter. And he wrote all these letters. And he says, you want to know who the real letter is? You are. Your lifestyle is. You are living epistles known and read by all men. So here's my point. Your life, your example, your conduct, your behavior, your lifestyle validates your message. And this is extremely important. When Kathy and I first got saved, we, uh, we'd end up, we'd only been saved, saved about a year, and we were kind of those obnoxious Christians. I don't know if you've ever met one, and, uh, or were one. And so we had uh, we'd bought this house, our first house. And uh, we, in those days, the, um, what do you call it, the possession dates were months away. It was three months before we got our house. And so we went and lived with Kathy's parents. And every day we were like preaching to them and telling them about Jesus and telling them they needed to get saved. And they were like really annoyed by it. And finally one day, I'll never forget it, Kathy's mother stopped us and said, you know what, you guys? Actions speak louder than words. <laughs> wow, she just like da daggered us. And I mean, I was just cut to the heart with that. So then we talked about, we thought, you know what? We got to stop preaching to them. We got to stop preaching to them. And we just have to start living this out, living this faith out in a way that they will understand it. And uh, so we thought, well, we'll just live like Christians for the next three months. And by the end, they'll be begging us to become Christians. Well, three months went by and three years went by and 30 years went by and they never came to Christ. And we just continued to pray and continue to listen and continue to serve them and continue to bless them. And you know what? They actually really, really liked us. And here's the craziest part of the story uh, is that both of them, her mother and her father, both came to Christ on their deathbeds. And I led both of them to Christ on their deathbeds. Her mother at 84 and her father at 99 and a half. And the reason he lived till 99 and a, and a half was because he weren't saved yet. That's why. And we've been praying for him for 42 years. And finally, finally, I almost couldn't believe it myself. And, and, but, you know, I, I, I thought about it. I thought God kept him alive all these years. Kept him alive all these years too, just shy of 100 till he finally made this decision to accept Christ. And it was interesting that the very people that actions were not speaking loud enough were the very people that led them to Christ years later. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. It's so important. So, so the, your, your, your Jesus is your message. Your example is your medium. And your story is the method. Your story is the thing that connects with people. Let me tell you why your story is so important. Human beings are wired, hardwired for stories. Our, our belief systems, no matter what religion you are of, it, are based on stories. I mean, you look at all the world religions, you look at all the belief systems throughout history, they're all based on stories. There's a narrative, there's a story, because we can connect with a story. And so, you know, you, the, Greeks, the Greeks, of course, they, they had, you know, uh, Jupiter, and a, or not Jupiter, they had uh, Zeus and, and Athena and Hermes and all them. And the, the Romans, they had Apollo and they had, uh, you know, Mercury and Juno and all those, the, the planets. And then, you know, you look at the Norse and the Norse had Odin and Loki and Thor and we all know all that because we watched the Avengers movie. And so it doesn't matter what you look at, the stories are the things that resonate. And you grew up with stories, 
Aesop's fables, right, and Grimm's fairy tales, and you all know the story of Little Red Riding Hood, and you all know the story of Three Little Pigs. Why do we remember those stories so clearly? Because stories are what matter. None of you can remember calculus. Some of you took calculus in school. You don't remember it. You don't know, remember trigonometry. Don't tell me you do. You don't. There's nobody in this room that knows how to do that unless you're a scientist or something. But we could all explain time travel. We can all explain time travel. Every single one of us, we all know how to explain time travel. You have to get a DeLorean. You have to affix a flux capacitor on it. You have to drive at 88 miles an hour with 1.21 gigabytes, giga, gigawatts of power and you will go through the seam in the space-time continuum. We all know how, to, uh, how, how time travel works. Why? Because we saw the movie. We saw, but not one of you, I bet, could explain to me the general theory of relativity or quantum mechanics. We're, we're not gonna, we don't get it. We don't get that. But stories. So Jesus comes along. What does he do? What does Jesus do? He tells stories, they're called parables. He just tells one story after another story after another story, and you know them all. If I said, you know, tell me the story of the, the sower, you could tell me, or the prodigal son, you could tell me, or the fig tree, or you could tell me, or the lost coin, and you could tell me, you all know those stories. We don't know a bunch of theology, but we know the stories. And so that's why, in case you didn't notice this, that's why I tell so many stories when I preach. I tell one story after another. I don't think there's any preacher that tells as many stories as I do. Is that probably accurate? I mean, I tell one story after another. Why? Because people can relate to stories. We get stories. Stories make sense. So just real quickly, I want to give you, a, you're thinking, how do I share my story? We saw how Powell did it. Let me, here, here's three things real quick. Number one, try not to be long and boring. <laughs> I, I'm not joking about this. I sent a message to my son the other day, and he sent me a message back, and it was TLDR. And I said, what, is, what does TLDR mean? He says, too long, didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> so do yourself a favor, and everybody else, don't tell them some long, boring story that doesn't make any sense to them. And number two, try to relate to your audience. Notice what Paul did. He told, see, Agrippa was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was the king over them. And so he had to, he, so the story that Paul ta ta talks about is this, this conflict between the Jews and the Christians and where he is in the midst. He totally knew it. And so you try to find something that's going to relate to them. And then the, the final thing is here, look for connection points. Look for connection points. And uh, you know what Paul did, this is what Paul said. He said, I am all things to all people. To a Jew, I'm a Jew. To a Roman, I'm a Roman. To a Greek, I'm a Greek. Remember he said that? Was, was he all those things? Well, he was Jew and he was Roman, but that wasn't his point. He says, I'm trying to connect with them. I'm trying to find these connecting points where they can relate to me and, and my story. And so, for, you know, today I, I ended up meeting this, this uh, East Indian Sikh man. And uh, we started talking and, and so I immediately started, I told him I'd been to India. And I said, you, you know, you're, you're, you, did you come from the Punjab? And, and I started telling him, he was, and I knew all about his, the, their struggle for independence in, in East India, and he couldn't believe I knew all this stuff. And what I was doing was establishing these connection points with him. And he was far more interested in me because I knew about him and his history and where he came from and all these things than if I didn't know anything, right? And so that's what we do. My favorite thing is, is for me, I, I grew up as a Catholic. So my favorite thing is to share the gospel with Catholics because I have this affinity with them. And, uh, you know, here's the deal. I don't know if you know this, but w once Catholic, always a Catholic. I mean, when you're baptized Catholic, you're, you're still technically a Catholic. So depending if they're in the joking mood, I tell them I'm a recovering Catholic is what, <laughs> is what, is what I tell them. And I say, I, I, I did my first confession at 12 years old. The police took two days to drag it out of me. <laughs> you know, but I, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for getting that. And so here, here's what I tell them, because they, they all want to know, like, how, do, how was it that a Catholic like you became an, an evangelical? And here's what I do. I never criticize Catholicism, ever, ever. There's a lot of great things about Catholicism, and I'll talk about those great things and, and make that connection with them. But then I'll say, here's what was missing for me. I, I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. 
And the whole idea of going through a priest as a mediator, I struggled with that, and I, I just didn't feel like I had a personal relationship. And the one thing I found in churches like ours was I can have a personal relationship with a living God. And that's my testimony. That's what I tell people. And that's this connection point. People can relate to that. And whatever you've been through in life, the, the pain or a divorce or an addiction or uh, anxiety or depression, people can relate to that. You're human. So I want to kind of close with this story that uh, is really cool. And uh, I'm a bit of a closet. I don't tell people about this, but I am right now. I'm a bit of a closet fan of J Joe Rogan and his podcast. And he had Hulk Hogan on. You all know Hulk Hogan, the, the wrestler. And see, Hulk Hogan's on it. Hulk Hogan shows up on the podcast with a John 316 shirt. You, how many of you know who Hulk Hogan is? Tell me you all know who Hulk Hogan is. Thank God for that. And uh, I don't care if you know Joe Rogan, but Hulk Hogan, he, he's, my, he's my man. And so, so Hulk Hogan shows up. He's got this John 316 shirt on. And he tells all these stories from his life as wrestling. Now, Joe Rogan is a mixed martial mar martial arts fighter himself. So he loves this whole fighting and wrestling thing. And, and uh, he's just captivated by these stories. And Hulk Hogan had a million stories. And he told one after another, told the story about how he appeared on, on the, in the movie Rocky III. How many remember him in Rocky III where he beat the crap out of Sylvester Stallone? I loved it. Uh, look at this next scene. Look at this next scene. It's my favorite. Picked him up in the air, just crushed him to the ground. And uh, he got paid $10,000 to appear in this movie. And Vince McMahon man's senior of WWF fired him for it. So Joe Rogan's just totally into this story. He's loving this. And then he says, and th then Joe Rogan points out the shirt and says, so John 3, 16, I know, I know what that means. Like, how long have you been religious? And uh, Hulk Hogan just rolls into it and starts telling his testimony and tells the whole story. It's fascinating. You can go watch it. Uh, it's a fascinating story about how he came to Christ when he was 14 years old, and he tells the story, and then he went off into this world of wrestling and the drugs and the money and all these things and how backslidden he was. And he tells this whole long journey. And I'm going to give you a one-minute clip of it that will include Joe Rogan's response because I think it's fantastic. So let's roll this clip. I'm surprised. I'm going to go players been married 29 times all my boys been married 29 times everybody's been married 29 times right and all of a sudden when I went through this divorce and I really bottomed out you know it was a tough one and then my wife split with a younger younger man it was uh it was a little rough on me and then I started searching I started searching but it kind of led me down that path you know to start searching and finding what what worked for me and what mm. I believed in and ever since then, man, that's been the number one priority. And it kind of locked me in, you know, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what I believe in. And so everything else is a distant second to what happens around me. Yeah, yeah. that provides you with a lot of, like, peace, right? Oh, my God. That's you have the no thing idea. that all my friends that are very religious say, that it gives them a peace yeah. that, that I don't think people have without it, which is interesting. But I do know that a lot of people that I know that are very happy and grounded and centered are also religious. A lot of people. I don't think it's a factor that anyone should discount. He almost convinced me to become a Christian, said King Agrippa. And I listened to this. I mean, does that seem like a man who's resisting the gospel? I mean, and you, I love the boldness with which um, Hulk Hogan tells his story. And I mean, he's not holding back. I just gave you a little, a little clip of it. Understand, he's just right out there, flat out there. He's telling everybody how important that, that his, his faith in Christ is. Do you, do you guys have time for one quick final story from me? Can I tell you one more story? I'm going to tell you one more story. Sorry. Uh, you don't have anything else to do. It's Saturday night. I'll shorten this, this for tomorrow. So this summer, I, I got invited to this, this dinner. And uh, it was a, with a bunch of people I didn't know. And one of the things I do is I, I get a lot of Christians inviting me out for lunch. And that's nice. And I love Christians and stuff. But when non-Christians invite me to things, I, I want to go. Because I, I want to do what Jesus did and be a friend of tax collectors. And it was interesting. I ended up being invited to a dinner to eat with tax collectors, almost literally. 
And uh, the, this group of people were all millionaires, multimillionaires. They were, they were the people running away from the tax collectors, but they were like the tax collectors of our day. And uh, I'm sitting at this table. It was on the 4th of July. It was a 4th of July party. And it was Canadians who had gone to America and had made their fortune. And it was a friend of mine was putting on this party. And, uh, and it's really important for those curtains to go back in the middle of my message, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wrap it up. <laughs> and so, so, my, so my friend was having a 4th of, day, 4th of July party, so he invited all these people that were uh, uh, Canadians who had gone to the U.S. and made their fortune. They were all millionaires, and they were, they were uh, you know, doctors and lawyers and, and very, very wealthy people, and me. And I said, why am I invited to this party? He says, well, you've been to Florida, so we decided to include you in this. I said, <laughs> I said okay. And so then I got a little bit out of place, and then so we, he went around the table and he introduced everybody and introduced me as, as the pastor. So then he asked me if I would say grace. Now, I don't want you to miss this. I began with prayer. <laughs> Here's I'm telling the story. So I began with prayer. And uh, then we started to eat, and we ate, to, ate together. I ate together with some, some sinners. I, did you catch that part? Now, I was a little uncomfortable in this setting uh, because they, the, the, the host, no joke, decided he wanted to talk about politics, the Democrats and the Republicans. And I thought, I just better keep my mouth shut. I have lots to say on this subject, especially on politics. But I'm just going to. So you know what I did? I just sat there and I, and I listened. Are you following this so far? Wow. And, and, and so then what happened was when dinner was over, I decided to uh, clean off the table. So you know what I did? Sure. I served. I served. Man, thank you. And uh, I was pretty quiet all night. And uh, then at the end of the night, as it was winding down, they literally, one of the men actually literally said to me, so you're a pastor. Tell me what's going on with Christianity today. And he gave me this big introduction. And I sat there and I was able to share my story and share the gospel with all these people that were so far away from Christ. And I thought, this is the blessed lifestyle. And it's not that hard. I, I just went, and I didn't realize it till after. I thought, I just did the blessed thing. I just did it. And all I did was get invited to this event and, 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 and said yes, and did my small little bits along the way. And I know what that is. is it's, it's a concentrated version of the, of the whole process that is really the long story. But the reason I'm so emphatic about this tonight is that every single one of you can do this. You can all do the blessed lifestyle. You're called to this. The world needs you. And following means fishing. Let's stand together.